hosts for this evening, the founder and director of the Bisexual Book Awards and the Bi Writers Association, Sheila Lambert. She is also the editor of the groundbreaking anthology, Best Buy Short Stories, and is working on the first anthology of bisexual poetry. And let's take it to Sheila. Thank you. I am coming to you from the Bisexual Book Awards Library, AKA my living room. I think you can see a bunch of books back there where they're all double stacked. So there's twice as many books as it appears. <laughs> I've kind of run out of shelf space. Uh, there's more shelves here, there's more in the hallway. Um, we have more bisexual books in our collection than in any library in the world. And now I would like to introduce your other host for the evening, Michael David Gordon, who is a singer, songwriter, an actor, and the front man for several bands, including the Beatles, a Beatles cover band, and the Apple Bonkers, classic rock and Motown. He is working now to put out his first album of original songs, and he'll be premiering the very first song from that album later tonight. I'd also like to introduce, oh, sorry, Tony. We'll get that other paragraph in later. Uh, my partner in crime for this event, Tony Johnson, AKA Tojo. He has been handling all the technical aspects of this event and more. Without Tony, straight up, there's no event. So please give Tojo a big round of applause. Wave, Tony. Ooh. Okay, so here comes my speech. This April, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I've got to make this. Uh, wait a minute, I've got to get this font larger. I can't even see where to do that. Okay. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I made the decision to cancel our annual June multi-arts reading and book awards ceremony, which had always been conducted in person. New York was heading into a crisis, stay at home orders were about to be issued and we were becoming the eye of the hurricane in the pandemic. It was hard to imagine celebrating bisexuality or pride since our event is usually the kickoff to Pride Month here. At that time in April, I had never even been to a Zoom meeting, let alone run one. Sadly, well, luckily I'm not really running it, Tojo was doing that. Uh, sadly, I thought we would just have to forego our annual event this year and our eighth annual authors would not get the opportunity to share their work with our live audience. We announced our award winners online and called it a day. However, after attending the Toronto Bi Arts Festival and other bi events over Zoom and streaming, which we're doing both of tonight, I realized that even if we can't celebrate while all sitting in the same room together, we can still be together in another way. In fact, now that our location barriers have come down, tonight will be the first time in Bisexual Book Awards history that we will be coming to you virtually. And no matter where you live in this country or across the globe, we can share our very special event with you. We will be simultaneously bringing our show to you on Zoom while live streaming it to both YouTube and Facebook. And uh, tonight we have audience members joining us from Vietnam, Australia and New Zealand, the UK, Canada, Michigan, California, our, and our tri-state area of New Jersey, Connecticut, and of course, New York. Woo! Welcome to the world. <laughs> so um, the Bi Writers Association organizes the annual Bisexual Book Awards, including our multi-arts reading. Not only do they gather submissions and organize uh, the judging, but they are also the foremost voice promoting bisexual books, bi writers, 
bisexual writing, and bi-themed arts and culture in the US. They work to dispel myths and stereotypes about bisexuality and have organized a book club, open mics, panels, a summit, film programs, educational workshops, in-service trainings, the whole Megillah. Uh, they provide networking for bi plus writers in all aspects, journalism, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, songwriting, erotica, plays, TV and movie scripts. And as we mentioned, they have the most extensive library of bisexual books anywhere on the planet Earth. Give it up, give it up for the bi folks. <laughs> so uh, two quick notes before we begin. If you are live, tw live tweeting tonight's program, please follow and tag us on Twitter at Buy Book Awards and use the hashtags. You're ready for the hashtags? Here we go. Hashtag Buy Book Awards. Hashtag Buy Writers. Hashtag Buy Bisexual Books. Hashtag Bisexual Book Awards. Hashtag Books. Also, we'll be having a short question and answer session at the end of the readings. And if you have a burning question for one of our writers during the event, please write it in the comments or chat, starting it with the number four Q and A, and then where you're from. And Tojo, I like that. He sounds like a basketball player nickname. Tojo <laughs> will be collecting all of the questions. Okay, back to you, Sheila. So let us begin this evening with our fiction winner, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Nema, because apparently I've been pronouncing it wrong for the last year. So I thought it was Nama, but Nema by Sarah Blake and published by Riverhead Books, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. With the coming of the great flood, the mother of all disasters, only one family was spared, drifting on an endless sea waiting for the waters to subside. We know the story of Noah, moved by divine vision to launch their escape. Now in a work of astounding invention, acclaimed writer Sarah Blake reclaims the story of his wife, Nema, the matriarch who kept them alive. Here is the woman torn between faith and fury, lending her strength to her sons and their wives caring for an unruly menagerie of restless creatures, silently mourning the lover she left behind. Here is the woman escaping into the unreceded waters where a seductive angel tempts her to join a strange and haunted world. Here is the woman tormented by dreams and questions of her own, questions of service and self-determination, of history and memory, of the kindness or cruelty of fate. In fresh and modern language, Blake revisits the story of the Ark that rescued life on Earth and rediscovers the agonizing burdens endured by the woman at the heart of the story. Nema is a parable for our time, a provocative fable of body, spirit, and resilience. And the names of the bisexual slash bi plus characters or characters in the bisexual ballpark are, um, according to Sarah, all of them, but in particular, Nema and the angel. Sarah Blake, pronouns she, her, is the recipient of a literature fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, which is amazing. I didn't even think they were giving out anything anymore after what happened in like the 80s and the 90s. Um, her writing has appeared in the Kenyan Review, the Three Penny Review, Slice, and elsewhere. So let's give Sarah a round of applause. Remember to unmute yourself, applaud, and then... <laughs> okay, Sarah, are you ready to take it away? I'm ready. Uh, and uh, Nama is fine to say Nama. There's a lot of ways to pronounce the name. It's still a commonly used name, so it just go by individual. I just name is how I was saying it in my head. 
when I was writing and she didn't exist out loud yet. Um, but yeah, it's a name from left to Genesis. Um, and so are the, and the other women's names are based on the names given there. So, but anyway, so this is, this is part of one of, uh, the dream sequences and the two characters. And I say the other name in this section, weirdly too, uh, Hael, but I think a lot of people say, uh, J J gel I don't know <laughs> um, but we'll just go with what's in my head um, and uh, but he's a, a talking cockatoo so if you're confused when he first shows up that's who he is so um, gonna go so but then the world starts to spin and she does too until she spins right into the center of the planet she's created there at the center the stones enter Nama's mouth and her vagina, and they fill her until she becomes a giant stone woman filled with a giant stone world baby. She starts to walk through the heavens. Hail flies around her head. Are you a woman, Nema? Yes. Nema is surprised at how difficult it is to move her giant stone lips. You look like a dead volcano that grew legs. Hail lands on her head. He sees a ruby grow legs she says most living things can't grow new legs either he says Hael picks up the ruby and places it in his own eye Nama spots the sparkle of it as Hael flies around her Hael she says you have ascended into the heavens just like my name yes but how how are you here she asks I am dreaming Nama keeps walking gaining distance on other planets and stars I figured it out, he says. You and Sarai couldn't both have dreamed me up, so I must have dreamed up both of you. That would be easy. Nema doesn't feel cold or warm. Her stone skin no longer registers such sensory things. She tries running her right hand up her left forearm. No, she thinks, nothing. How can you be a woman if you have no body? I have a body, Nema says. You have a shape, I'll give you that. Nema looks down at herself and thinks he may be right. I still feel like a woman, she says. Let me go in, he says. I'll figure it out. She opens her mouth and Hael flies in. She wants to swallow him immediately, but he perches on a rise along the edge of a molar. Don't bite down on me now, he says. If she responds, she'll crush him, break all his hollow bird bones. Maybe you are a woman in your heart, Hael says. I'm going to see. He flies down her throat and squeezes through the stone wall near her heart. He travels from the vena cava into the right atrium of the heart. Pump your heart, Nema. Nema surprised. Her heart has been still this whole time. But he's right. She can control it with a thought. She triggers a heartbeat and Hael flies into the right ventricle faster than he expected, shrouding his head in his wings for protection. Then he's pushed out to the lungs. He rests there, tucks himself into an alveolus, doesn't let the heart pull him back yet. He likes the little cave of the little berry within her. Nema can't feel him there. She's focused on keeping her heart beating. She's so focused she stopped walking, and her motionless body projects the sound of her, heart, of her beating heart louder than anything else in the universe. Hayo lets his body be carried back to the heart, into the left atrium, and then the left ventricle then out of the heart through the aorta. As he tumbles through, he spreads his wings and stops himself. Nema can't see him, but if she could, she'd tell him he looks like an angel in a holy hall. Then Hael gathers himself and flies straight upward through layers of stone that seem to part just enough for his body to push through. Soon he's out of her neck, landing on her shoulder, which is like a large flat peninsula projecting out into space. You can stop beating now, Hael says. She relaxes. You were not a woman in your heart. I wasn't. Not distinctly. I'm going to keep walking, she says. Where are you going? Away, farther. I think you should be going to somewhere. I think you should have exploded by now. That sounded rude, she adds, without the pressure of the atmosphere around you. I have the force of you around me, Nema. That was lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. Nema 
is available, and I'm with you, the pronunciation, I love it. NEMA is available any everywhere books are sold and also can be ordered. You can also find Sarah at her website, sarahblakeauthor.com, at Sarah Blake Sarah on Twitter, and at Sarah Blake Author on Instagram. Sheila, take it away. Well, I have a special announcement to make. Um, tonight, via this bi-culture event, we're putting to bed our eighth annual season and we're putting out our call for submissions for our ninth annual season, right here, right now. If there are any authors out there with a 2020 bisexual book, we want it. <laughs> you could be reading your book next year on our program. If you'd like to submit, check out our submission guidelines page on our website at bywriters.org. And there's also a write us button on the menu bar. So just click on that and you can contact us and we'll send you a submission form. Um, this year to start with, we have 10 different book categories and two special categories. So if you have a book that has a bi plus slash and character, storyline, subject matter, or themes, and was or will be published in 2020, please submit now. The deadline for submissions is December 2nd, 2020. But, you know, we like to start early. We have a bunch of submissions already. And, uh, you know, those... We'll be working on them soon, <laughs> working on reading them soon, or our judges will be. Um, but I, I read the books too. I try to read at least 50 books every season. And I, you know, peruse the rest of them. That's about 49 and a half more books than the average American reads, I think. <laughs> I'm just saying, I love America, but I'm just saying. Okay, so are you doing the next one? No, it says you are, but I will, only because I love this title. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, next we have our nonfiction winner. From Psychoanalytic Bisexuality to Bisexual Psychoanalysis, Desiring in the Real, by Esther Rappaport, Rutledge. This is the first book to assess. I love that title. I feel, I feel like I want to say it three times. Uh, <laughs> the whole thing, and you didn't make <laughs> This is the first book to assess bisexuality through a range of psychoanalytic and critical perspectives, highlighting both the issues faced by bisexual people in contemporary society and the challenges that can be presented by bisexual clients within a clinical setting. Examining bisexuality through the lens of Lacanian, Wicconian, and relational psychoanalytic theories, the book outlines the ways in which the concept is at once both dated and yet still tremendously important. It includes case studies to explore the issue of widespread counter-transference responses in the clinical setting, in addition to using both bisexual theory and em empirical research on biphobia to comment on the social pressures facing bisexual men and women and the resultant psychological effects. Bisexual identities and practices have become increasingly visible in recent years. And this important book addresses the lack of critical reckoning with the topic within the psychoanalytic community. I feel like I should get applause for that. Uh, <laughs> Esther, <laughs> that's wonderful. I, I, I wanna read this book. I'm getting this book. I am freaking getting this book. Um, Esther Rappaport is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalytic candidate maintaining a full-time practice in Tel Aviv, wonderful city. She teaches and lectures widely in professional and academic settings around Israel, issues on topics of sexuality and gender and culture in psychoanalytic work and on culturally sensitive clinical work with LGBT clients. She's also active in the relational psychoanalytic community. Let's give it up for Sarah. Take it, Sarah. Go for it, girl. 
uh, Esther. Uh, thank you. Wow, this is exciting. So um, I am um, going to read a little bit from uh, uh, chapter four um, in the book that uh, talks about bisexual subjectivity through the lenses of Lacanian object relations and relational theories, psychoanalytic theories. Winnicott's thought can be another lens through which we can seek an understanding of what it might mean to be a bisexual subject. Winnicott emphasized the value of authentic or creative living made possible by, quote, existing and having a feeling of existing, unquote. An expression of the subject's sense of aliveness, the true self, has, the capa has uh, quote, the capacity to fend off states of psychic rigidity, unquote, and to choose potentiality over fixity. Unlike the compliant false self, which is careful not to displease and sticks to the beaten path, the true self is always in the process of becoming and like an infant who doesn't yet have a self is capable of a, quote, spontaneous gesture, unquote, whose form and direction cannot be known in advance. Psychoanalysis for Winnicott was a practice of playing whose ultimate purpose was awakening or reawakening the patient's true self qualities of spontaneity and playfulness. In the spirit of Winnicottian thought, Bisexual subjectivity can be understood as a particular stance towards one, toward one's erotic and romantic life, one that is predominantly playful and curious rather than instrumental or, or security seeking, focused on experience and process rather than predetermined visions or goals, one that does not shut off potentialities but rather surrenders to them and that relates to to sexed bodies, one's own and others, as transitional objects with both end qualities rather than stationary objects with set essential properties. Let me elaborate on this last idea of sexed bodies as transitional objects. In bisexual sexual practices, preconceived notions about the functions of male versus female bodies are often taken very lightly or altogether discarded along with traditional gender roles. Instead, participants creatively experiment with idiosyncratic mixed and changing roles, acts and uses for sexual organs. In this process, one's own and one's partner's bodies can take on new previously unexplored roles and meanings, facilitating access to unknown or less known aspects of the self. Creative erotic play of this kind with a partner whose sex anatomy differs from one's own or with multiple partners with various anatomies often becomes a vehicle for lessening one's rigid identifications with the habitual normative positions and roles experienced as false self by many subjects. And unlearning the set ideas about what a body that looks a certain way is supposed to be doing. Instead, subjects spontaneously try and discover new forms of, of sexual self-expression, which can feel exhilaratingly authentic. Bodies that, that thus take on transitional object qualities in the sense that they simultaneously hold both conventional objective meanings, ones that predate the subject's emergence, and new meanings, deeply personal and unique to the subject. And with as with any transitional object, no commitment is required or in fact can be made to only one of the object's contradictory meanings. One does not grasp or capture the essence of one's own or one's partner's sex body through such play, but rather encounters the ungraspable, paradoxical, and not really making any sense aspects of embodiment, desire and enjoyment, an encounter that is sure to deepen one's feeling of aligned of aliveness and capacity to play. I'm uh, skipping over to another paragraph. Emmanuel Gens' thinking on surrender offers yet another conceptual tool that can aid us in understanding bisexual subjectivity. 
In his influential paper, Masochism, Submission, Surrender, Masochism as a Perversion of Surrender, Ghent synthesized the ideas of Winnicott, Michael Eigen, Marion Milner, and others to point to what he suggested was a universal human need to surrender, that is, to temporarily let go of one's defenses of false self out of the need for an expansive, transcendent experience of the kind familiar to artists and spiritual practitioners. Experiences like these, Gant suggests, are vital for healing and growth, so much so that, the, that when, when they are not possible, more pathological variations on the same theme are sought, all to allow the individual to experience letting go and being held by someone or something outside the self. In Gant's words, the ultimate direction of the surrender to intimacy with another is the discovery of one's identity, one's sense of self, one's sense of wholeness, even one's sense of unity with other living beings. Bisexual practice may be thought of as a practice of surrendering. A bisexual subject surrenders to physical and emotional intimacy with various the sexed and gendered others who are likely to differ widely from one another in their expectations, fantasies, and degrees of activity versus uh, degrees of activity versus passivity and more, with the anticipation of changing in complex, non-linear ways, difficult to predict or trace. The comfort of knowing who one is is willingly given up in exchange for the nomadic uncertainty and newness of confusion, loss of ground, and becoming a stranger to oneself yet again. As the storm subsides, the psyche begins to reorganize to accommodate the new experience. One learns about the changes in oneself experientially by discovering unfamiliar desires, fears, and strengths. I'll stop right here. Thank you, Esther. Thank wow. You. Israel. This is the kind of thing that, you know, we're able to do under, oh, hi, Robin, under, uh, you know, virtual programming. We can get people from Israel. That is amazing. At 2 a.m. At 2 a.m. Even more props to you for that, really. Oh, my God. Thank yeah. you much okay so so important for the you know psychoanalytic community to be looking at the lives of bisexuals so thank you for that work really thank, thank you. you sheila okay. you want to talk about judges yes i do because without our judges there would be no bisexual book awards we recruit over 30 judges annually to read and evaluate the books in each category. So each category has a different team of judges. So that's a lot of judges. They review, discuss, and vote on the books using our three main criteria to determine the finalists and the winners. Our three main criteria are the quality of overall writing, the quality of writing about Bi, plus, bisexual, pansexual, fluid characters, uh, bisexual themes, or bisexual material. And then also the quantity of bisexual material. So it's like a three-legged stool. You need to have, to be like a really good bisexual book, bisexual plus, pansexual, you know, whatever. There's a whole umbrella universe spectrum of bisexual to pansexual to fluid to queer to two-spirit to you know so many different words we use to describe ourselves or people who just labels are anathema to them completely so um we are thinking of all of that when we say the word bisexual or bi plus um so Quantity of, okay, so it's like a three-legged stool. You got to have a good amount of each for the stool to be stable. You know, if you have a lot of one and only very little of another, it's going to wobble. So that's what we're looking for is a book that has a good amount of each. And then, you know, for the 
category that it's in? Does it have the elements that one would look for in a category like that? And, uh, you know, are the ideas in it fresh? Um, is this a scenario that we haven't really seen before in a bisexual book? You know, so um, those are the kind of things that we're looking for. Um, this is our judge recruiting season. If you love to read, if you are a fast reader, if you have experience writing book reviews, even if it's just on Goodreads or Amazon or your blog, if you like free bisexual books to read, um, you might be our next judge. Just go to the Write Me page of our website and send us an email if you're interested and let us know the top four categories you would like to judge. And the categories are all listed on our um, um, submission guidelines page. Although maybe the bottom few are not, don't always happen. <laughs> but, um, and let us know what you think your qualifications are. We love librarians, teachers, academics, professors. We like, I, I've got a list somewhere that I didn't have time to find. But you know, really, if you're the kind of person that just loves to read and you're, you're passionate about reading and you'd like to read more bisexual books and have people to discuss them with, um, you're our kind of person. Okay, so um, I think you're taking the next one, Michael David. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, by the way, that's, um, no, let's go on. Um, the category is poetry. And the book is Colonize Me by Ben Hameen Naka Hasabi Kingsley from Saturnalia Books. From Nippon refugee who America caged. From Anandaga son, who America imprisoned, who they couldn't board into whiteness. From rust belt trailers, from two wheelbarrow factory workers, from PA to LA to MIA, to out here in West Baltimore, from counting every penny to carving the love of poems, from unheard prayers, and these unanswered dreams. We are here. I am here. I am alive. Colonize me. Ben Hameen Naka Hasabi Kingsley belongs to the Anandaga Nation of Indigenous Americans in New York. He is the author of three books, Not Your Mama's Melting Pot, University of Nebraska Press, Colonize Me, Saturnalia Books, and Demos, Milkweed Editions. Ben is recipient of the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, Kundiman and Tickner Fellowships. Let's give it up for Ben Hameen. Thank you, Take so it, my friend. friend. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Michael David. Um, like you heard a little bit from the intro of Colonize Me, uh, there's a lot of ethnic elements going on here, a lot of racial uh, mixing uh, on my mother's side. I'm Onondaga by way of upstate New York and Japanese. And on my father's side, I'm Cuban and Appalachian. Um, and sometimes people think it's, you know, out of this world crazy that, you know, two mixed race people could love one another. Um, but I think if we're going to believe in a, a lot of love to go around, this is a great reading uh, to believe in that. So the first poem uh, really leans into those themes. I have two, maybe three. We'll see how the time goes. Let me make sure I don't go over time here. Uh, it's called Of What America? How to Assemble One, a Native, Two, a Nippon, Three, Cubana Body, and Four, Appalachia. My burnt body hangs crisscross over beach dunes, below where family gathers, children's ringing, sand laps toys tangled in teenage lust, the skin consciousness, 
potential of everyone eyeing one another in sunbursted bottoms. There is nothing here but the bliss of this day. And so I think on death, hanging out over the Pacific, so many dead. Mi familia, Watashi Kazuko, Kawaii Ya, my kinfolk. There are four ways to name the century of dying in me. What passions grew a mixed, mixed skinned boy who would plant his body here and witness a happy beach rooted in the smile of so much untilled history. Somewhere far, the open ocean ferried my padre between Cuba and Miami swam pescado inside each swell of lung. Unmoored, he said, until his mind fell into love with the woman who fled America's internment camps, a pregnant Nippon daughter's flight from San Diego to Somerset, PA. Tagami, Kakuyo, I'll write you letters. She touched the shovel-shaped incisors of a Native American boy whose floorboards were still booting the, re the re-education each Podenoda song, de facto fathers, my Onondaga origin bowed beneath the whip of whiteness lash. He laid down love for my kin who ran skinny rail lines was split Appalachian silt and moral. My feet saddled all the loose mud of so many continents where everyone is gone some days and some days they aren't because I believe on days like this, with a mouthful of expiring sun, the potential of a small beginning, what sustains a soul across imagined borders, what finds tortured bodies, their song of forward rejoicing. The second poem uh, is about, um, uh, I used to read this poem a lot and I would almost, almost cry every single time that I, that I read it. So we'll see how I do this time. Um, but it's about Jason Pirro. He was a 14 year old uh, Chippewa boy uh, who was shot on his home in Bad River Reservation. Um, and there's a dark joke that I love that, you know, they don't even give our reservations good names. Um, and he was shot uh, once in the shoulder and once in the heart um, by a cop uh, right outside of his home. And this poem is for Jason. It's called, I can't close my eyes without seeing Jason Pirro's body. Boys like us don't make national news. That's what we tell each other fleeing. The long blue arms of police LEDs, our high top Reeboks kissed gravel, miles of central Pennsylvania street. Us not old enough to have kissed a lover, boys like us, cops shoot and ask questions never. We laughed, we ran, we laughed, we hollered pig as if it was just another pickup game of basketball on blacktop. We were so young. How young is too young to teach a boy never turn his index finger and thumb into the hammered steel of a gun. You might die, I breathe for decades, older and older, and now when I close my eyes, I can see Jason Pirro isn't with us boys, us running from cops. Jason is at home. He was a teddy bear, said his grandpa. He teased his little nephews once in a while, but that was the meanest part he had. Jason Pirro is in his front yard making the best of our bad river reservation, turning porch boughs into a drum set, each stick cracking stained wood. He imagines making it all the way to high school, drum line, and here comes that cop with report of a man carrying a knife, and here is Jason drumming, and here there will be no justice for death, no video evidence of Jason's dying, just this one that plays out endlessly in my head. The greatest horror writers know it's worse when you can't see 
the monster. Jaws that catch, claws that bite, hidden just off screen. In Onondaga, our clan mother says, Tsentha, I hide something, Akwariakon, in my heart. But tonight I am done with hiding. Jason Pirro was shot once in the shoulder and once in the heart. And my heart beats faster the longer I sleep, the longer I close my eyes, the longer we hide. Thanks so much. Your poetry honors Jason, my friend. Thank you so much for that. Sheila. So, uh, now let me introduce our first musical performer of the evening. What? He's already sitting right here? How convenient. Coming up next is the talented Michael David Gordon with an original song premiere right here. So um, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, when I, uh, when I wrote this song, uh, co-wrote it with my writing partner, um, Logan Evan Thomas, um, I had just met a gentleman uh, who was a professor at uh, City College. And um, it's interesting because he was a poet and I remember he had written a poem um, about Ryan White, uh, which actually uh, brought me to tears. And that's kind of how we met. Uh, so it's really interesting that uh, Ben Hamin, you read that poem uh, just now. And I, again, I thank you for that and I honor you. Uh, okay, um, this song is called $22. And um, <laughs> I wrote it or co-wrote it along with my partner, um, one of the things that I think about a lot is um, what is, who are you as a person? And what are the things that make you who you are? In my case, one of those things is of course being bisexual. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily come up in this song per se, uh, one of the things I always talk about is if I'm in the room and if I'm doing something, there's bisexual presence. And I really do feel that way. So I hope you enjoy this tune Thank you so much. It's called $22. And it goes something like this. <laughs> I have a whole band here in my apartment. It's amazing. I got $22 in my bank account. And I know that someday things are going to turn around. But I wouldn't trade a thing if I could have you here with my $22 in my bank account. Do you don't know how much time I spend all day thinking? The thought of you with me seems so clear. Okay. And when the stars are out, I look up and start wishing. I wish tonight that I could have you here. Some people call me a pauper. But I can promise you one thing. I'll give you all of me. Me? Right now, I don't have much to offer. No. But we're young, the sky's the limit. One day, I'll make you see. Please. $22 in my bank account. Searching for the things I need up in the lost and found. But I'm spending all on you, girl. I don't even care. Cause I want to see you smile. That's the only thing that matters. I got $22 in my bank account. And I know that someday things are going to turn around. But I wouldn't trade a thing if I could have you here. With my $22 in my bank account. 20 Every morning I get up and check my visa card, yeah. Make sure I got enough money left to feed you. 
Yes, yes you, you baby. baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Doing the paycheck to paycheck dance to make it. Yeah. Gotta have enough bank left so I don't have to make it. No, no. I can't afford to buy your diamond. No. But I promise you one thing. I give you all of me. Ben, Sheila, yeah. I'm not as rich as Paul Simon, no. But we're going to Scarborough Fair, baby. Just wait and see. Twenty-two, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't even care. Smile, smile, smile. Twenty-two dollars in my bank account, and I know that someday things are gonna turn around. But I wouldn't plan a thing if I could have you here with my twenty-two dollars in my bank account. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, no, no. The songs that you oh. sing, I just didn't realize that you wrote it. I thought yes. you always sing it with your classic band, and I thought it was just a song I didn't know. And remember, yes. I even requested you because you were singing little <laughs> snippets and posting yes. them during the worst part of the pandemic. And I was like, could you sing that one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now I got to hear the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get everybody's name who's here into the song, but I couldn't I couldn't scroll fast enough. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> well, I'm honored that I made it in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take it, Sheila. <laughs> Thank so you so much. Next up is our headliner of the evening, our by writer of the year winner. Uh, author of Lot's Wife, an erotic retelling by Rosalind Chase. And that book was independently published. And what's really unusual is this is the first time that an erotic fiction contender won by Writer of the Year. But Lot's Wife is a full on novel. It's not just, you know, scenarios. So, uh, where was it? Oh yeah. So this is another ancient biblical story of the destruction of Sodom. I don't mean there's been other ones like this. I mean that Nema was an ancient biblical story sort of reimagined. This is another ancient biblical story that is re being reimagined. Uh, the destruction of Sodom is re-examined and reimagined, no longer a symbol of female weakness and disobedience. Lot's wife is a woman who discovers her own sexual power, a mother who must protect her daughters, and in the end, a proud citizen of a doomed city. Every step along the way brings her closer to the moment she will make a choice. We all know how this story ends with a backward glance and a pillar of salt. But that's Lot's version of the story, isn't it? And the names of the bisexual characters or characters in the bisexual ballpark are the protagonist, Lot's wife, Kali, Nasha, and the third lover. Uh, Rosalind Chase, author of Lot's wife and from Darkest Seas, writes romantic, magical realism, and Appalachian Gothic fiction. Originally from the mountains of North Carolina, she lives in Los Angeles. Let's give her a big round of applause. Take it away, Rosalind. You don't know my name. You never will. But I was a weaver once. My work was famous throughout five cities, further even. I was a daughter, a daughter of Sodom. I was trained by my father, the finest weaver in a generation, and I took his place when he died. And then there was war. 
I married. I took for a husband one of the conquerors of our land because I thought he'd be kinder than the rest. I was wrong. I lost my identity, my profession, my passion, even my name. Now, as I walk away from my home, as I keep my back to it and to my past and to my very identity, I am one thing only, Lot's wife. But I walk. I left my house while it was still dark, while the city was asleep. We were told to be away from Sodom before dawn rose, and my husband is nothing if not obedient. Lot led us away from the city, my youngest daughters trailing behind him, me at the rear. In a few hours, the sun goddess will wrap her warmth around the earth. The sandy landscape will light up red and orange. The terraced hills with almond trees and scrubby grasses will seem to sway and the sky will be an azure dome. But for now, in the near dark, I see only the shadowy ground, the black silhouettes of the hills, the fading stars in the sky. The city behind us is still glowing faintly in the cool pre-morning light. I know this because I've seen it before because I've seen it a hundred mornings, a thousand, but I do not look this morning. We have been instructed to only look before us, not back, never back. Lot leads the way as if he knows where he is going and I suppose he does. He is going back to one of the other cities his army conquered along the way to mine. Perhaps this new city will be more to his liking, more solemn houses of prayer, fewer temples filled with wine and decadent mosaics, more husbands and wives sitting silent vigil, fewer men and women singing and dancing so full of spirit it cannot be contained in their bodies, more tight-lipped judgment, fewer raucous celebrations, more of him, less of me. He walks onward and I pause in my tracks, Sodom is my home. I was born here. When I was a girl, my parents loved me. I was their only child, but they never seemed disappointed that I was the only one, that I was not a boy. I watched my mother die in Sodom. I helped her weave her own funeral shroud, first helping hang the weighted warp threads, later by running the shuttle or holding the weft out for her to select. Teal and silver on white. The colors will always remind me of her. I learned my craft in Sodom. My father took me into the workshop so I would not be mindless and mute in grief. He too had helped with my mother's shroud. And in his workshop, dipping weft threads into dye and watching their color evolve, I began to understand the usefulness and necessary nature of our craft, the color texture, the stories we told. I met my first love in Sodom and my second and my third. And I met my husband there. Now I look without seeing at the rock under my feet. I have stood on this hill more times than I can count. And I know that once we crest it, even if I turn around, I will not be able to see my city any longer. And so I linger here in this moment. The wind blows and my shawl drifts from my head and tumbles around my shoulders. My hair escapes, it is wild. Darkest brown shot through with burnished copper and streaks of white. It whirls in the breeze. It whips like it knows it is free, finally. My left hand is empty and it twitches at my side. Today there are rings on my left fingers, a plain gold band, a silver one set with a small emerald, a ring carved from delicate ivory and a braided one, the most delicate, the most beautiful. It's this one worn on my smallest finger now that I spin with my thumb as I stand in place. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes. Thank you.
Okay, so it. what we're gonna do to save time and boringness is if everyone could put all of the authors and performers, I've lost the, there we go, could put their name and their links, any links you want people to know about, your website, your social, whatever, put it in the chat so people can copy and paste it uh, somewhere and save it so they can get in touch with you later. And for all of you that are watching any of the live streams, all of their information is down below in the description. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Wow. Look at all these comments. I'm just blown away. Woo. Yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, so let me find my place. Okay, there we are. Something about it being an election year. Hmm. <laughs> what did you say? It's an election year? <laughs> well, oh, it God. is 2020, which oh, means, God. yeah, it's an election year in the United States uh, for those of us who live here. And we want to remind everyone just how important this election is for both our country and our BIPLUS community. If you are a U.S. citizen and aren't registered to vote as of yet, please register right now at vote. Gov. If you're nervous about missing something in tonight's program, we'll give you some time to register before the Q&A. To find information about voting in your area, we recommend going to rockthevote.org. But Tony, if it's vote.gov, vote is that just for New York or does that cover the whole U.S.? That covers the whole U.S. covers the whole U.S. Thank you. Or the home Magilla. Okay, next up is, am I going, Michael David? So far, yes, you are. Okay, because it seemed like I've been talking a lot lately. We both um, been talking a lot, my dear. <laughs> okay. Our uh, speculative fiction winner. Speculative fiction encompasses a whole bunch of things. Like Bi-fi, sci-fi, fantasy, horror, vampires. Uh, so we aggregate it together into speculative fiction. And our speculative fiction winner wrote a fantasy novel titled Shatter the Sky by author Rebecca Kim Wells. And that comes from Books for Young Readers, which is an imprint of Simon Schuster. Although most imprints don't just, hey, let's do this kind of an imprint. No, they just like see someone else who's doing great and they gobble them up. And then it becomes part of Simon and Schuster. But, um, okay, so raised among the ruins of a conquered mountain nation Marin dreams only of sharing a quiet life with her girlfriend Kaya until the day Kaya is abducted by the Arati, prophetic ancient agents of the emperor and forced to join their ranks. Desperate to save her, Marin hatches a plan to steal one of the emperor's coveted dragons and storm the Arati house stronghold. If Marin is to have any hope of succeeding, she must become an apprentice to the Aromatory, the Emperor's mysterious dragon trainer. But Marin is unprepared for the dangerous secrets she uncovers. Rumors of a lost prince, a brewing rebellion, and a prophecy that threatens to shatter the empire itself. Not to mention the strange dreams she's been having about a beast deep underground. With time running out, can Marin survive long enough to rescue Kaya from impending death? Or could it be that Marin is destined for something greater than she could have ever imagined? And the names of the characters in the bisexual ballpark are Marin Ben Gao. If 
that's how to pronounce it, I wouldn't really know. You know, in a book of fantasy, you're making everything up. Um, Rebecca Kim Wells grew up in California before moving east in search of crisp autumns and snowy winters. When not writing, she works at a fiercely independent bookstore in Massachusetts and spends too much time singing along to musicals. Shatter the Sky is her debut novel. And now let's, let's clap for Rebecca. Hey. Thank you. Uh, you pronounced Marin Van Gaal perfectly. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so this, this book is my first book, and it's more affectionately known on the internet as the Angry Bisexual Dragon book. And I'm going to read from uh, just toward the end of chapter one, right before it gets very angry. Okay. And it's a conversation between uh, Marin and Kaya. Great. I promise everything is going to be fine, better than fine. Kaya moved closer, and I turned onto my side so that we faced each other, noses almost touching. Shall I tell you about all the things we'll do when we leave the mountain? All the adventures we'll have in Zafed? There was a world of enchantment tied up in that word, Zafed, as the, if the lake and our village and the mountain itself weren't a part of the empire to begin with. She settled her head against the sand and matched her fingertips to mine without mating, waiting for an answer. It will be spring, she said quietly, just about this time of year, maybe a little earlier, and I know you'll want to throw the whole village into your pack, but I won't let you. We'll go down the mountain and spend a night at the inn, and then we'll go on to Delatev. From there, we'll travel to Gedarin and see the ocean, and then go north until we find the ice bears, and finally we'll meet the Flame of the West himself and prove ourselves worthy of becoming talons, and will give us dragons of our own. I sighed. He'll give you a dragon, maybe. You'll probably save his heir's life or something, and he'll be thrilled to admit you to the dragon guard. But he wouldn't give a dragon to someone like me. No interrupting. Besides, he would, Kaya insisted. If there's any saving of heirs to be done, we'll do it together. Even so, I said, you'll dazzle, dazzle the entire capital while I applaud from the shadows. Then he'll give you a grand title, chief explorer maybe, and you'll be off across the empire and every once in a very long while you might write a note, wish you were here and send it back to me. And I'll be hiding at the palace, faithfully awaiting your return. I could never do what you do anyway. Kaya reached out and squeezed my hand. You don't really think that. The longer I was under her gaze, the more I believed she saw straight through the words I'd said only half in jest. The look she gave me was challenging, daring me to reject her declaration of my worth. No, I said, walking away the part of me that had let those words out in the first place. Of course not. Good, she said, because you'll be brilliant too. You just don't know it yet. I refrained from stating just how much I didn't know anything of the sort, because it didn't matter. Just because, just as this talk of dragons didn't really matter, for everyone knew the Emperor of Zafed would never grant a dragon to a girl from Ilvera. As long as Kaya and I were together, we would be happy. It didn't matter that she would leave without me if she had to, because I knew I could never leave her. We were going to be together, even if it cost me the mountain and everything I'd ever known. Kaya turned so that her back was to me and pulled my arm over her waist. I nuzzled my face against her neck, inhaling the distinct, salt-sweet, honeyed scent of her skin. Under the summer sun, we fell asleep. The sky was purpling when I woke. We were clearly late. I shook Kaya awake and we brushed sand off our bodies as best we could before scrambling into our trousers and shirts. We shoved our feet into our boots and trotted briskly up the beach and down the trail that my grandmother had said was once a wide road of polished white stone. Do you think they've arrived, I said. Not yet, Kaya replied, ducking around a tangle of thistleweed. We would have heard the horns for sure, and... A deep, somber note sounded in the distance, reverberating through my chest. Kaya and I looked at each other, the alarm in her eyes mirroring the fear that quickened my pulse. The Arati Seers were here. Thank you.
Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. That's great. great. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Um, well, folks, it's 2020. And as you know, this is the year of the census. And uh, the census counts everyone living in the country, regardless of their nationality, their citizenship, their sexual orientation. Um, and a complete count ensures the accuracy of each state's representation in the House of Representatives, that place that is so important to us right now, and informs the distribution of over $675 billion annually in federal funding for community programs. And that's everything from HIV emergency relief project grants, block grants, um, housing assistance, career and tech education grants, child and adult care food programs, projects for assistance and transition from homelessness, and many other programs that directly and indirectly affect the lives of the LGBTQ plus community. So if you haven't yet, please, please, please go to 2020census.gov. That's 2020census.gov and fill out the simple form. It takes about two minutes. And um, if you don't wanna do it now, that's cool. There'll be a little bit of time before the Q and A to fill it out, but you can also fill it out after you're done. Uh, it really takes a couple of minutes and it's incredibly important. So, and if you're streaming or not watching this live, um, just, you know, you can hit pause and then you can come back to us when you finish it. But whatever you do, please get it done. It's really important. And we'll all be really happy and grateful that you did. Thank you. Sheila. The Sorry. teen young adult winner. I was out uh, changing my outfit. I knew that. That's why I was I was vamping just a little bit. I just want. I mean, I was going to sing you in, but it's cool. Go ahead, do your thing. You look fabulous. Costume changes here. <laughs> the audience doesn't get bored. Well, you're like you're like Diana Ross, so that's really good. Yeah, costume changes. You know. <laughs> Am I showing my age? Maybe so. Anyway, take it. Okay, so you covered that. And by the way, going back to the voting thing, I'm sure you all know. But you know, you can request uh, an absentee ballot or a mail-in ballot, whatever your state calls it. Um, <clears throat> I I get them, and because I will, especially right now, I don't want to go to a crowded place and have to be breathing the air for one or two hours. Uh, just to vote. I'd rather vote from the comfort and <laughs> security or healthiness of my own home. So, uh, please vote. Now's the time. Yes, please vote. We really need. Uh, we need to make things different. In this and, and for you cats that aren't here in the country. Send us your prayers. We need them. Trust me, because we are a hot mess. Please, thank you. Okay, so uh, our winner of the teen young adult category uh, is Deposing Nathan, and that's by Zach Smedley. And the book came out from Page Street Kids. So for 16 years, Nate was the perfect son, the product of a no-nonsense upbringing and deep spiritual faith. Then he met Cam, who pushed him to break rules, dream, and accept himself. Conflicted, Nate began to push back with, uh, sorry, I can't read it. With each push, the boys became more entangled in each other's worlds, but they also spiraled closer to their breaking points. And now all of it has fallen apart after a fist fight turned near fatal incident, one that's left Nate with a stab wound and Cam in jail. <sighs> Sorry, hot flash coming up. Uh, Cam in jail. Now Nate is being ordered to give a statement under oath that will send his best friend to prison. The problem is 
the real story of what happened between them isn't as simple as anyone thinks. With all eyes on him, Nate must make his confessions about what led up to that night with Cam, and in doing so, risk tearing both of their lives apart. Okay, the name of the characters in the bisexual ballpark are Nate Copeland and Cameron Cam Hayes. Haynes. Zach Smedley, pronouns he, him, grew up in Maryland in an endearing county almost nobody has heard of. He has a degree in chemical engineering from UMBC and currently works within the field. As a member of the LGBT community, his goal is to give a voice to marginalized young adults through gritty, morally complex narratives. I'm all for that. So let's welcome Zach Smedley to reading. Hey everyone. Uh <clears throat> As mentioned, I'm an author whose debut novel, Deposing Nathan, was released last year, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from that. Um, you guys just heard what it was basically about, but essentially it's a best, a, um, our main character, Nate, is giving a court testimony um, talking about how he met his best friend, Cam, and how they were very close at first, and then got very, very close, and then things gradually fell apart and wound up to where... Um, they had a near deadly uh, falling out. And so um, the book is kind of like one giant argument. Um, I'm trying to bring a little bit of like Aaron Sorkin's writing style to YA. He's the guy who did like the West Wing and the Social Network and all that. Um, so this scene is about halfway through the book. Um, the two boys have just experimented together sexually for the first time. And now they are debating about what just happened. Our main character, Nate, is in a lot of denial because he's very religious, um, whereas his best friend, Cam, is a lot more comfortable with everything. <clears throat> no one's here, I say to him, glancing back and forth. We scooch ourselves further under the pavilion, watching the rain pick up. So let's talk about it, Cam says. We need to talk about it, dude. What's wrong with you, I say. I thought this was our thing. Not romantic, no labels, no nothing. We both knew that was bullshit, man, Kim says. He stands, starting to pace between the picnic tables. So listen, real talk. I'm pretty sure I'm bi, and I think you might be too. If nothing else, I kind of prefer not to reinforce the stereotype. Wait, what? Uh, the stereotype that says all bisexual people are chronic cheaters. No, no, I mean, when did you, since when are you bi, I ask. If you have to know specifics, I figured it out on March 7th. Like, okay, bisexual, is that an actual thing? Cam squints at me like I've just suggested he give heroin a try. What? I say. I'm not trying to be a dick to him, but no one ever explained this stuff to me. You either like guys or girls. It's a legitimate sexual orientation, he says. Since when? The answer to your question is always, dick. I shake my head. Dude, think about this. You messed around with a guy once. Everyone experiments a little. You still like girls, right? Definitely. So there you go. You're straight, except for one little little road bump okay well first of all i'd enjoy doing it again second of all little road bump isn't a nice thing to call yourself and third cam just stop third of all even if you're like one percent into dudes it can still count okay bisexual is like a pretty broad term so who's to say that's even the right label for you i ask on march 7th i did i take a breath and try again it sounds like you just enjoy acting by what else matters? What the fuck else matters? He shouts, grabbing his own head in frustration. Why do you think anyone has a label in the first place? It's to let other people know who you'd be okay being involved with. No offense, but I'm having a tough time believing you. No offense. <laughs> You're supposed to be my best friend. Why can't you just be, you know, happy for me? I'm not happy that my best friend is turning his back on our church, I say. I don't have time to decide if I'm angry, tired, or hurt. I just keep talking. How about that? I have literally never felt as close to God as I do now, Cam says. At first, I think he's being sarcastic, but he sounds entirely serious. Okay, I say, rubbing my forehead. Clearly, you either don't understand why the church condemns gay sex, or you don't care. No, 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 it's both, he says. I don't understand, and I don't care. You can't be a Christian like this. 
I, I tell him. Turns out I can. You're seeing me do it right now. I'm just stating a fact, I say. How can you justify this? I don't know what you're trying to ask, but if you're wondering why I'm not designing my sexual identity around a few sentences from a 1,200-page book that was last fact-checked 2,000 years ago, I don't have a fucking answer for you. Christianity is about love. It is about acceptance. It is about not being the grade-A dick you're being right now, and I'm every bit as much a part of that movement as you are, if not 10 times so. I shake my head at him, entirely drained. That stuff we did, I say. Gay stuff. It, it goes against everything. It is impure and it is filthy. Well, Kim says, if you're doing it right. You are not hearing me, I shout. This is important. Yes, he says, looking me over, his eyes brimming with ghosts. It is. And I will leave my dramatic rendition there. <laughs> Zach, my brother, you've been eavesdropping on people's conversations, my man. How is that possible? You're like 15, 20 years younger than I am, and yet you eavesdropped on my life. That was great. That was <laughs> thank excellent, you, my friend. Thank you so thank much. You. That was excellent. <laughs> thank yes. you. Um, thank you. Um, if you notice, um, I did a little costume change myself in honor of Beyonce and Bruno Mars and all Sheila and all those folks. Uh, up next, original music. Robin Renee. Robin Renee is a performing songwriter, writer, and an organizer in the bisexual and polyamory community. Robin's recordings include In Progress, All Six Senses, Live Devotion, Spirit, Rocks, Sexy, This, and All I Am. Along with Wendy Sheridan and Mary McGinley, Robin Renee co-hosts The Leftscape, a podcast dedicated to exploring politics, culture, and conversation through a progressive lens at robinrenee.com and leftscape.com. Let's give it up. Give it up for Robin Renee. Thank you. <laughs> it's kind of an autumn song. I don't wear sweaters and I don't walk home. I don't think God is that I call my own. I don't climb fences that I never see. I come to my senses when you give them to me. And I'm born in the morning and I, I am the town and I, I'm making a deal now and I. I'm underground Children, children, children All the children sing I was hanging with the Joan Pro girls In the Pennsylvania spring But my eyes were sacred When the new was new Watching you play and dress up Like the little girls do But I don't wear sweaters And I don't walk home I don't dig gardens that I call my own. I don't climb fences that I never see. I come to my senses when you give them to me. And I'm born in the morning and I'm on the town. Underground. Whoa, won't somebody give me some time? I'm no daddy's poster boy, if you wouldn't mind. But I wasn't ready for this long a fight. Mother, I love you. Can I say goodnight or night? I'm born in the morning.
sometimes Giving and taking and blurring things Life is not so easy Growing up and to go East in the winter I'll never get cold Cause, Cause now I wear sweaters And now I walk home Now I dig gardens That I call my own Now I climb fences I never did see Anybody else, but Robin Renee has a new fanboy today, Michael David. Yes, you go, girl. That was fabulous. I can't tell you wonderful. how long I've been waiting to get her on the program again because she lives in, you know, South South Jersey. So as soon as I realized, hey, we're doing virtual this year, I'm like, snapped right on that. But well unfortunately, another person that I you know, been wanting to get on the program for years. 
didn't make it today, Ann Heaton, because she injured herself doing yoga and, uh, you know, her back just completely seized up and she couldn't do a thing. So, um, unfortunately, we won't have her with us this time, but we will have more time for Q&A. So, take it away, Michael David. So, uh, just a really quick plug for um, a group that's really helped out a lot in preparing for this tonight, uh, By Request. Uh, By Request is a social and discussion group from New York uh, for all who identify as bisexual or biromantic plus or multi-gender attraction spectrum and otherwise queer identified or questioning folk, regardless of labels or lack of them, regardless of uh, gender or age or race or ability, economic status, uh, moderated discussion meetings that focus on bi plus topics and they're held each Monday on the first Monday, second Friday, third Thursday, and fourth Wednesday on Zoom, <laughs> just in case you were gonna miss anything. Uh, socially distance, of course, um, and virtual get to know type events. Uh, please hang out with us, okay? It's, it's a great organization and keep an eye out for the events on meetup.com slash bisexual NYC. Okay, next, erotic. By request, that's how come we know each other. Yes, yes, we know each other from by requests and, you know, the spirits. Uh, next, this category is erotic fiction. And the winner is Three for All by Elia. Is that pronounced? Yes, Elia Winters. No, Elliot, thank you. Elia Winters, thank you. Um, and it's from Cecilia Press. When Jeff starts fantasizing about bringing a woman into bed with his husband, Patrick, he has to admit that he's trying to appease his curiosity. For Laurie, finally ready to move out of small town Mapleton, there seems to be little harm in a fling, even a fling with her sexy coworker and his husband. One night is never enough. And their chemistry together hints at the possibility of more than just an affair. The excitement of a new relationship makes Jeff and Patrick wonder if they're just infatuated or destined for non-monogamy. But Laurie's future plans are pulling her away from both of them. Can a marriage survive when two people in love both fall in love with someone else? Names of bisexual or bi plus characters or characters in the bisexual ballpark. I love that bisexual ballpark. Uh, Jeff Robinson and Patrick Walsh. Elia Winters is a fat tattooed. <laughs> thank you, a fat tattooed polyamorous bisexual. Go girl, who loves petting cats and fighting the patriarchy. She holds a <laughs> master's degree in English literature and writes geeky kinky, cozy, erotic romance. Elia lives in Western Massachusetts with her loving husband and their weird pets. Take it away. Thank you so much. So I am reading a section from, um, it's Lori's first time visiting with Jeff and Patrick. She's been invited over for dinner and after dinner, they start talking. Patrick's gaze flicked over to his husband, then back to her. I'd love to hear about your research. Sometimes people asked her that, like she was going to tell them a list of sordid details from orgies, even though that wasn't what polyamory was about. From Patrick, though, it sounded like both, a genuine invitation and a come on. His tone was soft, sultry, and a bit playful. She wanted to give in, flirt back, but it felt wrong to do disservice to her topic, so she went for the honest route. The first part of it was pretty dry. Lots of books, most of which said the same things over and over. A fair share of academic journals on human sexuality and psychology, but the later research was better. A lot of interviews with polyam people. Most in person, some by Skype. Most in person, Jeff repeated. Are there that many polyamorous people in Mapleton? More than you'd think. Lori was always surprised by the way small liberal college towns attracted non-traditional relationship structures. 
but I traveled as well across New England, more cities than towns, a good amount in Boston, and a bunch down in New York. Patrick stroked his beard. Do you think we're all a bunch of kinky degenerates? Lori shrugged one shoulder. I'm sure some of you are. She smiled, eyeing Jeff near her on the couch. He was more than she'd expected, flirty, confident, driven. Although he was pure buttoned up professor at work, he unbuttoned quite a bit at home and she wanted more. But I like the kinky degenerates, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. Jeff laughed. I think everyone's a weirdo of some kind when you get down to it. Yeah? Lori shifted, watching Jeff's gaze follow the slide of her hem above her knee. Perfect. What's your perversion of choice? There are lots of people who would call me a pervert just for being a queer man, let alone a black queer man. Jeff moved as well, turning to face Lori more directly. Several feet of couch still separated them, but he seemed much closer like this. But I'm a Harvard graduate and I have a PhD. So it is my highly educated perspective that those people can fuck off to hell. Surprised, Lori laughed like it was punched out of her. Jeff raised his eyebrows then smiled broadly as if tickled by her unexpected laughter. Beyond that though, he continued, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of experience being a, what was the phrase? Kinky degenerate, Patrick answered from the armchair. Right, I told you before, Patrick was my first real relationship. I haven't had the opportunity to branch out very far. Jeff removed his glasses, folding them neatly and setting them on the coffee table. Without them, he seemed more open, his dark brown eyes locked onto Lori. Lori nodded to the glasses he'd just removed. How far can you see without those? You're a bit blurry, but not much. Lori got up and moved over on the couch, closing the distance between them. How's that? Jeff blinked, lips twitching slightly. Not so blurry now. Her heart thudded against her ribs. She'd had reasons why she shouldn't do this tonight, but she'd thrown those aside the moment she saw Patrick and Jeff together at dinner. Jeff's hand moved from the couch to the outside of her knee, his fingertips skimming her skin and raising goosebumps. He hadn't looked away from her face since removing his glasses. The arm Lori had draped over the back of the couch brought her so close to him, and she let herself lightly touch the back of his neck. She wanted to be even closer, so she drew her knees up onto the couch, kneeling instead of sitting. Have you ever kissed a girl? She asked. Jeff smiled. I've kissed a few girls. How long has it been? He tipped his head to the side. A long time. He looked over past Lori's shoulder, probably at Patrick with sudden uncertainty. Lori didn't turn around. Hey, Patrick? Patrick's smile was evident in his voice. Yeah, Lori? She began to trace circles on the back of Jeff's neck. I want to kiss your husband. Jeff shivered, his eyes falling half closed, and he licked his bottom lip in reflex. Fuck, Lori wanted to taste him, her body hot like she had a fever. And I think your husband wants to kiss me back. Patrick's chuckle sounded low and filthy behind her. I think so too. What do you think, Jeff? Jeff didn't say anything, focused on Lori's mouth his body fairly vibrating with tension. Her skin tingled, leg hot where Jeff's hand now pressed. His other hand slid up to cup the back of her neck just as she held his, and for a few heartbeats, they stayed frozen, neither ready to make the next move. Patrick's voice broke the silence. Oh, for God's sake, Jeff, fucking kiss her already. Smiling, Jeff pulled Lori's mouth down to his. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Elia. Woo! Blushing. I'm. I would blush too if you know. Anyway, go on. Which one of us is next? Because I was down here fixing something. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, technically, you are. Um, but it's cool. I can go. It's cool. Um, what's next? category? Well, yes, Sheila. Shall I? What category is it? Poetry. Oh yeah, go ahead. The poetry winner. Yes, Turn Around Bright Eyes by Rosebud Ben Ami from Get Fresh Books. Ben Ami's remarkable propensity to question everything has colored her life and work. Born to a Mexican American mother who converted to Judaism after meeting Rosebud's Jewish father, Ben Ani grew up in South Texas and attended Hebrew school 
in the conservative, predominantly Christian and Catholic Southwest. You are a powerful young woman. Enduring systematic ostracization from a young age, Rosebud grew up escaping into books, K-pop, and science, counting the days until she could leave. This complicated incongruence is something that Benani has never forgotten. This might help explain the otherworldliness of Benani's poetry, which sings of the secret, complicated places in every human heart. Her new book, Turn Around Bright Eyes, is a stunning coming of age collection, heavily influenced by K-pop culture and New York City. Themes of disenfranchisement, rejection, rebellion, and power struggles prevail but Ben Ani's musicality radiates with light and hope and conveys the tender influence of her parents, both of whom supported Rosebud's creative, inquisitive art. <laughs> oh, is that, is, okay, hi. Ready? Take it. So I'm gonna read the first and last poem in the book. Um, so the first one I'm going to read is called Mata Rose Tags G-Dragon on the Seven. Uh, when I was younger, I would tag, um, and my name was Mata Rose, and then G-Dragon is the leader, right, that's what they call it, uh, the leader of a K-pop band called Big Bang, and the Seven is my beloved Seven Train, which is my train. Mata Rose never comes home. She's hungry like a wolf. She's Rosa de Molten Lacroix, all the girls hail on Queens Boulevard. All the views she's killed in the name of Iman and Yasmin Liban. Mata is quite meta. Mata means kill. Rose occur from the real meat of it all. She's part my little pony. Into bronies, she has loved and loved not by astro pony compatibility chart. She's the queerest part of me, what's left after the club's close and has yet to go home. She never goes. When she writes, I always write in bed, just wolf down a three musketeers. Mata's on a mission, which is to say I'm my most queer, my most Mata Rose, when she and I don't need all the girls in the yard, don't need all the girls in the yard, by which I mean the one who's not the one, whose blocked text and torn up wish you well slicker still. That riddle gets you killed kind of a woman for whom Monta Rose almost cut off a foot went to the end of two butt ghosting rails. My love is a little afraid of Monta. He accepts her though, lets her come and go because I stay, I am always with him because Monta just wants every seven train to dissolve into G-Dragon sound, wants you to hell. Boom, Monta, Monta, boom, Monta, Monta, wow. G, Monta, Dragon Rose, the most pony of them all. G Mata seven dragon train rose don't wait up never last stop never comes boom Mata Mata boom Mata Mata home. That poem's actually not true anymore. I'm going through a divorce, but you know what can you do? Um, so this little uh, this last poem is I guess for in the words of Zach being a little road bump in so many women's lives. Um, so this is called I guess we'll have to be secretly in love with each other and leave it at that. And I just want to thank the organizers and all the readers and my publishers here, Roberto Garcia. So just thank you, everyone. To can't do, to overly over you, to te amu wrong name, to songs of wronged, I think we, and planting boxwood and snowdrop for not our winter children, nor sweet box or winter berry, to FaceTime in winter silence for hours, to know Camilla's and Christmas Rose touching through a screen and still not sorry about some horse I knew in Iceland for less than a week. And some other life lurking on black sand shores to my life to yours. To sulking under half sunken moons and all the places we won't go. To not Airbnb and haciendas of arid rooms and canopy beds engraved with lions rose tailed and rose maned to drug restaurants that serve only cobra lilies with a side of blackbirds who wield spiked hammers, a kind of punishment for that horse I still long for, to splinters and spitting the names I'll never curse you in kitchen inferno when burning certain animals without remorse, to your most exquisite stews and fermented cabbage jars I won't break rushing to catch a broken down train, to that first trail we miss to falling off an eroded hoof print, to the city you saved by sticking a scorched trainer in sliding door and what's so wrong with hell anyway, 
to happiness as a betrayal of what is happening to people we love and to people not just waiting around to die, to love as resistance, but not always the way back, to I can't, can't I? To you crashing into the bathroom and fishing me out of the sink and carrying me in your arms like that scene in The Bodyguard. Only the song I sing has no queen, has no eyes or dreams. There is only dim and dog-eared cottage to forgiving me for all the plums I most certainly devour. To the platypus and Fisher King, to breaking in case of emergency. To reading Adonis in a crowded bar while television signal flare amid a canopy of crows. To having hope and our pop-up wit of the world, its edges sour and peeling to never having really left Jerusalem, which is why I'm still busted stars and throwing elbows. To the hours we made horses between nightfall and war, to should go home, to leaving it the longest way of derailed horse cry and amorithine bones. Thank you. I'm also a little drunk, I'm not gonna that lie. Was, Thank you. That was incredible. That was incredible. <laughs> um, is there any wonder, Rosebud, why you were the winner of the 2019 Alice Jame Award, as well as the 2014 NIFA Fellowship in Poetry and the 2013 Canto Mundo Fellow? I mean, you rock. That was amazing. You all rock. Right? Thank you so much. That was incredible. That was amazing. I and I can hear that. I can hear that K-pop thing happening too. Totally. Thank you so much. That poem again, that I, I love it. <laughs> Rosebud. I'm sorry? Could you say the name of that poem again? Oh yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. That's like a great name for a bisexual poem. Yes. So as we wrap up with our final reading of the night, um, I'd like to say thank you, thank you, thank you to so many organizations and people who help us get the word out about this event. Again, by request of uh, the Brooklyn Community Pride Center, Rainbow D, Joshua O'Connell, uh, board leader, New Haven Pride Center, bisexual and bi-curious women, San Francisco, Biosphere in LA, also the Bi Arts Festival, BiCon UK, and the Stand By Us BiCon in Australia, and NZ with whom we formed a mutual Thank you. <laughs> Which is for New Zealand, sorry. Yes, no, I understand that. Some, but sometimes you say NZ just in the interest of time with whom we formed a mutual PR agreement to help promote each other's events. So thank you all very much. We greatly appreciate it. Sheila, take it home. And I also want to again thank Tony Johnson who is our technician for the evening and also for weeks, you know, figuring out how to set this all up and make it work. Um, he is a cop. Oh, hail. Yes, definitely. Because there's no way I could have done that. My eyes would just be going cross-eyed. Um, he is a costume designer by day, a bisexual artist and activist by night. Each summer, he hosts a series of Bi Plus family potluck picnics throughout New York City. And that's the only reason I was able to get him is because the pandemic, he wasn't doing no picnics. <laughs> so I had the courage to ask him if he would help me with this project. And I was so thrilled when he said, yes. Okay, so um, next up, we have the romance tied winner the name of the book is Out of the Shade, and the author is S.A. McCauley, and it was independently published. And here's a little synopsis. Jesse Salomona had always tried to be the perfect straight guy. That he hooks up with just as many men as he does women is a secret Jesse's been hiding for years, fearful of losing his family and tight group of friends. When Chuck joins one of the Kensington Boys Community Center Sports Leagues, Jesse's self-imposed rules are systematically demolished. But there's one barrier Jesse can't find the strength to break through. 
coming out to the other Kensington boys. Chuck is damaged by his past. Jesse is frightened about his future. But together, they may just be able to come out of the shade. And the names, names of the characters who are living in the bisexual ballpark are Jesse Salomona, main character, and Lila, side character. And Sam is a wandering LGBTQ author who sleeps little and reads a lot. Happiest in a foreign country, twitchy when not mentally in motion. Her name is Sam, not Sammy, and definitely not Samantha. She's a dark, cynical, jaded person, but hides that darkness well behind her obsession with shiny objects. Okay, let's get some applause for S.A. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna say um, it's wonderful to be with here, you all here tonight. Um, and I think I'm gonna have less than $22 in my pocket after I go out and buy all the books and music that have been featured here tonight. Woo! <laughs> And second of all, I need to apologize ahead of time if you're hearing my dog snoring as I'm doing my reading here. <laughs> he chose to lay down directly underneath my chair. All right, um, I'm going to read a little section from the beginning of the book before things get terribly angsty to do with the, um, let's stick with the romance side instead of the really angsty side right now. Chuck sighed with contentment. He and Jesse lay in bed with the comfort, comforter over them, two boxes of pizza between them. Precious sat out at the foot of the bed and tumblers of whiskey on the nightstands as they watched the game. Chuck tried to focus on the drone of the announcer's commentary, filling airspace, but Jesse hadn't stopped touching him since he joined Chuck back in bed. Jesse's fingertips ghosted over his skin, following the whorls that filled in the gaps between the black and gray scale tattoos associated with particularly painful moments in his life. The job he'd been fired from for speaking out about abusive management, the first man who'd used him solely for sex, the death of the only grandparent who had stood by him when his parents disowned him. Jesse traversed that map of sorrows with his hand and his eyes, gliding over the curve of Chuck's shoulder and down his chest to the star inked below his left nipple. Chuck couldn't restrain his flinch. Ticklish, Jesse asked. Chuck shook his head. They're just all really personal. Jesse immediately drew back. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. It's okay for you to touch them. Jesse was one of the few allowed to. He met Jesse's gauge. You can ask me about them too. Okay, which one was your first? Chuck took a deep breath. It wasn't easy for him to talk about any of his marks, but this one was the least painful. He pointed to the bold black no in black letters on his forearm. I got this one first. So what's the story? I was 16, drunk and out with friends. It seemed like a good idea. But what does it mean? It was a reminder that I didn't have to say yes if I didn't want to. Two? Mostly to what other people expected of me. It took me too long to realize that I needed to be living my life instead of other people's. Chuck stared at the bold letters, his hand gripped tightly in a fist. It hadn't been solely his parents he was saying no to. The teammates on his high school soccer team who found out he was queer and ripped into him every time the, co the coach turned his head. The supposed friends who'd abandoned him when he'd started spending more time with Ben. His parents' elitist social circle who spoke of him being a black mark on the Dunbradley name. So he'd made that black mark his own. He'd cried when that needle first dug into his skin, accepting the pain and reveling in the thought that he'd never seen his dad shed one tear. Then his dad had threatened to skin that tattoo off Chuck's wrist himself. That made Chuck only want to get more. The physical pain had faded long ago, if not the emotional echoes. Jesse circled his fingers around, around Chuck's wrist and ran his thumb over the tattoo in an almost reverent touch, as if he was counting out Chuck's heartbeat. Chuck flexed his fingers and sank into the gentle caress. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. <laughs> Every time someone finishes, I'm like, but they just started. I know, I know.
Okay, so we are. Uh, we're going to go into a Q and A. Yes. Well, first we're heading for a break. Yes. But before we hold that break, wait. No, I got it, Sheila. I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, we're going to move into a Q and A, but we're going to take like a really short, a real five minute break just to stand up, just to stretch, go to the bathroom, get a snack, whatever, fill out the census, <laughs> register to vote, <laughs> you know, paint a few walls. Um, but during this break, speaking of painting, we'll also be showing artwork by Jacob D. Hostetler. So don't turn off your cameras and, and your devices. Uh, Jacob is an artist who holds an MFA in illustration. He's a veteran. Thank you, sir, for that. Um, a husband, a father, he's an adjunct instructor, substitute teacher, and armed security officer. <laughs> My man wears many hats. Uh, he's also served as a judge in the romance category this season. And the paintings that you're going to see were inspired by romance. Um, joining the Bisexual Book Awards as a judge and as an artist has been his coming out as a bisexual. So welcome to the world, my friend. Uh, please enjoy his illustrations, and um, which will be on the loop as we do the break. So go off, take a break, and come on back, and we'll take a few questions. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for hanging in here. It, this is fabulous. This is family, and this is great. See you in five. Thank you.
right. Let's yes, indeed. Let's get into the Q and A, if we shall. So well, I'm going to send you the first question. It's going. That sounded good. All right. Got a question for me to throw out there? Um, I have a question. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's take some live. Okay, hi. It's Jan Steckel from Oakland, California, and I just wanted to say to the two poets how wonderful you were and how you really sent me. And I wondered if either of you is on Facebook, if you would like to come to the By Poets Facebook page sometime and post about your work and post a link to your books because there are 450 poets there and I know many of them would love to read your work. So I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for the great poetry. This is Jan Steckel, who I call the mother of bisexual poetry. <laughs> Thank you. She started that Facebook group to try to help get us more poets for the Bisexual Book Awards and yeah. the anthology of bisexual poetry that I'm working on. And, um, and so that's, definitely been helping and uh those are some very bisexual earrings you're wearing over there Jane. oh thank you yeah so <laughs> I rosebud's poetry on poets.org poetry.org and i posted it on the page but i couldn't find ben Kameen's work as easily so ben Kameen, i hope you'll swing by and and give us all access to your work you're great yeah thank you so much absolutely okay Anyone else with a live question you'd like to throw out? Uh, there's a question that I'm getting on the chat here. And uh, do you hide any secrets in your books or songs that only a bi plus person will find? Wow. That's such an interesting That's question. An amazing question. I've never heard a question like that. Yeah. Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I love the idea that I could come up with like a buy code, like a like a secret handshake, and I just don't know how I would do it, but I'm intrigued by the idea. Um, anyone else? I mean, I I I kind of dabble in that a little bit, um, but it's it's really within the construction of the lyrics and and how I write them. Um, there are some times when I will reference uh, a place or reference a bi character or uh, um, uh, reference a name that um, if you're listening closely enough and you're bi or if, um, if you're steeped in queer culture, uh, you might pick up on it. Um, but it, it, it's funny because I don't necessarily um, do it consciously most of the time. Uh, but there have been a couple of instances where I've done that. Um, but on stage, um, I do that kind of stuff all the time where I'll switch pronouns and things like that. And people, you can see them go, wait a minute, did he just switch that pronoun? Uh, so that's always fun. I'll answer that by saying I usually do exactly the opposite of that. Mm. Um, and and make, make bisexuality very prominent um, because I was definitely one of those people that um, was not aware that my sexuality was a thing until very much later in life. Um, so I go exactly the opposite, uh, opposite of that in my writing. So it's not a question at all. 
So it sounds like if, if someone had told you that there was such a thing as bisexuality earlier on, it would have helped you. And so yes. you in turn are trying to help other people who don't yeah. have that language or dictionary to fall back on. That is absolutely true. So, um, I've got you know, a it's funny. Uh, can I can I say something else? Um, it's funny that you were playing the Bessie Smith stuff because in Bessie's songs, like you know, once that you were just playing "Thinking Blues," um, you know, there'll be these little things that are embedded in the lyrics. If you know Bessie's life at all, you connect her life to the lyric, and then it makes complete sense that it's clear that she's singing to a woman. And sometimes she'll do that and she'll go back and forth in the same song, for sure. I mean, that's some of the genius of her work. This actually doesn't get talked about that much, but it's, it's a really great question. I'm sorry, Sheila, you were gonna say. Well, that's like what you do when you're performing because whether, I mean, it doesn't matter what lyrics you're singing because you're always flirting with people of different genders while you sing. So it's pretty obvious <laughs> that there's bisexuality going on on that stage. I feel profiled. <laughs> That's one reason why I have so much fun at your concerts. Okay, here's a question. How long were you a part-time writer before you became a full-time one? And I'm not sure who that's addressed to, or if it's just general. I don't see a name attached. Anybody? Uh, someone else? Oh, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I was just going to say, you know, it's, um, I'm not sure if that was addressed to someone in particular, but I thought I, as a full-time writer, would, would take a swing at it. Um, it's very difficult to be a full-time writer at least in the United States because most of us don't get paid enough to do it and also there are issues with health insurance and that sort of thing so I'm very privileged in that I have a supportive partner and my career is sort of like on the upswing but I also spent um, geez what year is it it's 2020 and I sp I've spent uh, 10 years working seriously on my writing before I made it to this point, eight years before I got a book contract and then two years trying to see, okay, was that just a fluke or is there something more that maybe I can start to like plan on? Um, so it took me tw uh, 10 years, 10 years of working full time on, on other things and writing on the side. And that's where I am. It's a lot Anyone of- Anyone else? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Anyone else want to take a stab at that one? Well, I write full time, but I also work full time. <laughs> so, mm. so, you know, I, I write I write weekly for the Kenyan Review, and I use weekly loosely because usually all my my stuff comes out at the end of the. <laughs> at the end of the um, month because I'm always behind. Um, so one thing I do want to like volunteer to the group, um, because the pandemic hit, I've actually been using my space at Kenyon to, because um, I just feel like I've, I've gotten so much, like I had a book come out, you know, in 2019, I, book, I have a book coming out in 2021, that the, Alice James, the one that won the Alice James Award. And so I've been using my space at Kenyon to, to promote other authors' work. Um, and so I run, I'm running every month a mixtape. So I believe like, you know, if you have my email through the email chain, I think that Tony sent originally, just send me like some latest news. It can be a publication, it can be an award. Um, somebody once sent me, hey, can you just feature this tweet I wrote? I think it's really witty. And then I went onto the tweet and it was really witty and I, fe I featured that. Um, so if you want, if you're interested in having your work featured, just let me know. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I write weekly for the Kenyan. I teach, um, I do manuscript consultations and I write. And so, you know, I always tell my students like, you're not gonna make any money as a poet, which is probably why I'm writing a novel now. I, I got mm. an 
And, and the agent's like, I keep trying to tell her, well, you know, I have this new book of poems I'm working on. She's like, that's great, sweetheart. How's the novel going? I'm like, right. you know, so it's a lot of sacrifice, you know, and divorce lawyers are expensive as I'm finding out. <laughs> so wow. it's just, um, it's not an easy life. And um, I think a lot of people write full time, but then they also work full time. So. Yes. Oh, I'm yeah. not a I'm not a full time um, author, but I, I have ten books out, and for a while that was wow. my goal is that I wanted to be a full time writer. And as a teacher, I have summers where I'm not working, and so um, I spent one summer like writing at the output that I felt like I would need to pursue a full time career, mm. um, and realized that I probably could do it, and it would also kill my love of writing. So I made a conscious choice to stop trying. Um, because in erotic romance, like there's in digital first, there's not a lot of advances, it's royalties. So like I'm, I'm making money, I really like it, but not having depend to depend on it has been a little more freeing for me. Um, and I'm social. So when I spent the summer just like writing alone, it was, I, I became a little uh, difficult to live with. I've been great in this pandemic, thanks for asking. So, um, I just am gonna keep teaching and keep writing part time. Tony, any other questions we should know about? Well, there's a comment here, uh, not chiming in because my writing could not support me financially at this stage, but I love hearing writers talk about how they handle this. Yes, it is so important. And, and, you know, I mean, as, as a fellow artist, you know, I am lucky enough, you know, to be able to support myself as a musician and as an, as an actor and as a writer and teacher and all that. But I just honor everybody here, really. I mean, the fact, it's such an act of bravery to put your work forward as, you know, the context in which you live your life. And I just really honor you all. I think it's spectacular and a real act of bravery. And I appreciate you. Whoop, whoop. Because this shit is hard. <laughs> no joke, this shit is hard. You know, we're not living in Stuttgart, Germany someplace. It's hard. Okay, so here's a, sort, a question sort of. Uh, it says, a bunch of the authors today had their first book published with a bi plus character. How exciting was it to make that happen? For it's, I think we ran out of grammar. How exciting was it to make that happen for, and were there struggles to getting it published due to the bisexuality? Okay, well, that's the question right there. Did having bisexuality in your book make it more difficult to publish? Anyone? I don't Sarah think Blake? so. Yeah, I think um, I I found an agent relatively quickly. I mean, I did. It took me a little while to find an agent that didn't say like, "Do you want to make this?" Uh, I don't know. M eat less weird. Basically, I had a lot of agents, so I was like, I could definitely sell this if it was less weird. But then once I found the right agent, she knew which editor to send it to, and he loved it, and Riverhead loved it, and supported it, and no one actually really talked to me about. Um, the bisexuality I, once the book came out then a lot of people were like well you know you've rewritten a bible story and you've made your main character bisexual and um like why and i i it's always the same answer which is just i think she would have been given the story and the length of people's lifetimes and the length of marriages and it just made sense to me i don't know <laughs> like, um so yeah it was uh but yeah i was surprised at how I didn't get any pushback any other than a few people at the beginning who were just like, I'm not sure who to sell this to. But as soon as the right person understood what was what it was, then then everything went really smoothly. And everybody's been amazingly supportive of it that um, I mean, that's not reflective on like Goodreads or of a forum like that, where then you just get a lot of people who are like, Nama would go to hell. She wouldn't be on the arc. So that's, um, you know, 
<laughs> it's, it is what it is. Um, and hopefully, you know, changing minds slowly. And I'm, you know, I think that's what art's for in a lot of ways. So, and I'm, you know, being part of this group has been really amazing and reading and hearing from other people's work in this group. I just find it really important. And yeah, <laughs> I'm grateful to all of you. I've got a question. Um, now, for everyone, really, uh, now that you've published a book with bisexuality, do you want to do that again? And how soon? Do you feel like you need to, you know, do something else? Change the, to, you know, make things easier to sell? The people, publishers might be like, oh, another bisexual book from the same author. Do you know, can you do anything else? Or do you feel like you can keep going there and discover something new every time, depending on the setting that you're putting your characters in? Well, um, uh, first off, uh, you know, like straight people never have to think about like, hmm, like, am I pigeonholing myself by writing another straight person into my next book? <laughs> so, so I'm like, you know, no, I, I, I am not going to, uh, you know, put myself into that like conundrum either because I should be able to do whatever the straight people can do. Why not? Um, in terms of what's coming next, I the Shatter the Sky was my first book. I have uh, two more coming, all with bisexual protagonists. Um, so happy about that. And also Simon and Schuster has always been extremely supportive of my work. And I think children's literature is having a great, um, a great time like recently, like five years ago, when I had a book on submission for the first time, we did get a couple of responses that were like, hmm, like not sure if the world is ready for this queer relationship. And now the same book that was rejected five years ago is coming out next year, <laughs> basically unchanged. So, um, so it's a great time for kids books and I don't feel any sort of like, I need to pigeonhole myself at all. And I don't think anyone should. Here, here. Well said. Um, anyone else want to take that on? Uh, I've got another question. Uh, okay. Um, how many, and this is to everybody, how many unpublished and half finished books do you have in your quiver, if you will? Or do you? That's, That's a dangerous an interesting question. question. That's it a is. dangerous question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I probably well I'm working on three currently right now like at the same time like switching between three but I have easily another ten that I've gone some kind of distance into them and then pulled back for some reason or another. I'm awful about those though. I want to jump in for that one because I actually somebody asked something similar on Twitter a while back and it made me make a list because I've been participating in National Novel Writing Month since 2001. And so um, I've written 27 novels and ten, like complete novels, most of which are bad and should not be published. <laughs> Like, they're fun. I have some, I have no memory of even writing. It's like I entered a fugue state, but 10 of them were published. It was my, like, I don't know, 12th, 15th book or something that actually, like, I didn't query all of them. Um, some were just fun. And I think I've got a few that maybe someday I'll go back to and clean up and publish. And some just should never see the light of day for the sake of humanity. <laughs> Hey, uh, Robin, I'm just kind of curious as a songwriter, you know, because sometimes it's a little different from for us. Um, do you have like a, a, a sort of a basket of songs that are either half finished or, you know, you finish them, but you're like, eh, that's not so good or maybe for another time, that type of thing? I'm just curious. Sure, thank you. Um, 
I have a lot of half-baked ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking about answering that question. You know, I have a, a, a novella that I wrote years ago that, you know, never really, whatever, it's a, it's a weird length of, of, of fiction, but it's, and fiction isn't really what I do so much. But, um, you know, I have a lot of different thoughts, you know, so I do have a lot, I have songs that I've, written that are just like, eh, maybe one day I'll recreate them into something that I really like. You know, I have, I have a lot of ideas that stick around somewhere. And sometimes those click. Like once in a while, there'll be a lyric that will I'll just have in my head or half of a song or a verse or something that one day it's like, that's, this is why I've had this for all this time, you know, and it'll become something. So, um, yeah, I've got a lot of scattered ideas and sometimes it's um sometimes it just takes the craft part of the work to sit down and go okay i'm gonna make something of these and sort of make and and create them but it's i think it's also okay to just kind of let them hang out until they mm -hmm. find their way to so, yeah. and, sometimes and sometimes they, they find, find you. you they call they you call back, back. You that's know? very true yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. and sometimes way, and sometimes you don't want to answer the call <laughs> like no you're you're a bad song i'm gonna leave you right where you are sorry well this kind of reverberated with your song michael david it's a kitchen magnet that i've had up there for years and it says so far i've saved 25 dollars for retirement wow <laughs> wow <laughs> Well, I can give you some of my $22 if you want. So I got you. I got you. Um, okay, got another question down here. It's a good one. Uh, what was your hardest scene to write? Hmm. Who wants to take that? That's a great question. That's a great question. Huh? Chewing it over. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can talk about a little uh, as you, so a lot of name is angst about uh, being on the ark is that God talked to her husband and not to her. Uh, and so by the end of the book, she talks to God. And uh, so a little bit of a spoiler, but not too bad. Uh, it's like, I think the book fails if I didn't try to attempt that scene, but that was definitely the hardest scene to write. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, that was, uh, I don't know how to speak for God. And yeah, I did. Um, but I had to build, I think like the writing the whole book led me to be able to do that. And I ended up doing a whole character for the Metatron and got to develop his voice sep separate from God's voice and the whole thing's just kind of bizarre um, as you can tell by the excerpt and everything else about this book um, but yeah so that was my hardest scene for sure anybody else want to tackle this I can answer that in terms of poems and I, I wonder too if anyone else has had these problems when they're writing scenes or, or poems um, so I wrote a poem called Guns on the Table and I wanted to explore violence on the US-Mexican border where I grew up and where my family is from without exploiting my family. And part of the reason why I wanted to write this is not only violence that is done against women on the border, which I suffered sexual assault, um, you know, from a very young age on the, in that place, um, but also how it just perpetuates and it feeds upon poverty. I came from a really poor family. And so I wanted to write this poem about my cousin's child, um, who's actually closer in age to me, um, about how he got wrapped up in the cartels. Like he was, you know, just like a, a low level um, gangster. And when he got arrested, he was 17 and they were going to give him the death penalty. And, you know, it tore apart my family. Um, and the last time I saw him was before the pandemic. I saw him in March. Um, and I just realized, you know, I'm probably not going to, so he ended up getting 60 years with no chance of parole. And so I realized when I was talking to him, because you have to talk through a glass, through glass, right, through a phone. and. 
I realized that I'll probably never hold this kid again. And I know he's not a kid anymore. You know, he's like in his thirties now, but um, I wanted to write this poem though, because I wanted to be honest about the way that I've sort of internalized violence, having also lived in Jerusalem on the border as a woman suffering sexual assault, um, which I haven't really written about until recently. I finally admitted that, you know, I was, I was sexually assaulted as a child. Um, I was very young, I was 10 and you know, how do you reveal these things without playing into stereotypes people have about the US-Mexican border, about cartels, about that, you know, I've been asked as a Latina, like, why don't you write about your abuelo or tortillas? Like, what's all this? Because I write a lot about science now, because that was my, actually my passion and, and being pigeonholed by the, you know, pa patriarchal straight white male gays, right? Straight people. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that was really hard. And so I just sort of, you know, I told my students um, recently, you know, you just kind of follow the music. If the poem is true and it reads true and you, nobody can take any word or line away from you, if you are being completely candid, then it's probably going to be a successful poem. So it was that moment sharing that poem with my family um, and, and my cousin who's, you know, in prison um, and he said, well, why would you ever think that we don't want to be forgotten? He's like, if anyone's to speak for us, you are from this place. And so I didn't read it tonight because I just get really upset. But, um, you know, it's, I'm glad the poem is in the book, but, you know, people always ask me questions afterwards because I'm very fair skinned, you know, I'm very fair skinned. And so they, you know, they say to me like, you know, when they see photos of my family and stuff like, oh, you know, you come from all colors of the rainbow. And I said, yeah, you know, um, but they're, they're, I guess, cause I come off a little she, she too, like a little bougie now, you know, I'm a lady now. I don't know. I'm a lady, I think, you know, I'm a lady now, but um, it always surprises them that I come from like this really rough place because they have preconceived notions of what it means to come from poverty. So, yeah, that was a long tangent, <laughs> yeah. Write, write the hard scenes, I think. Write the hard scenes and write the hard poems. Here, here. Anyone else want to tackle this one? Well, we've got another one. Uh, okay. Is that the blogs one, Sheila? What? There's a question for you here. Well, no, it's a question for me to ask. Oh, okay. No, Sheila, it's a question for you. That's what Somebody's I thought, yeah. a question for you to answer. That's right. I knew I wasn't crazy. Who are you messing with? Shoot, I know how to do this. <laughs> uh, uh, the question for you, Sheila, is, are blogs or internet serials a category for the Buy Book Awards? If not, do you think it ever will be? I, what? <laughs> I don't say it again. Are blogs or internet serials a category for the Buy Book Awards? You know, a blog, a blog or an internet serial, you know, a 10 part serial where there may be 15 minutes for each episode, you know, online. Uh, are those or could those ever be uh, categories for the Buy Book Awards? Uh, no. Um... We don't cover like individual stories. We don't have enough judges for that. We can't get enough judges for that. We were asked that on our by writers Facebook page one time by a bunch of young writers because they write single stories. And uh, we just don't have the bandwidth to do everything like single stories. I mean, once they collect those single stories that become a serial, and then if it becomes a book, then we would. But uh, if you look at uh, um, the guidelines, um, something that, for example, is an ebook, we can't accept that to the awards, but 
if that ebook is then published in print, then we would take it. And it doesn't matter that it was published as an ebook two years ago. If it's published right. this year as a book in print, even if it's just a print on demand. I mean, you know, that's how I got my own book into the awards and into the Lammy Awards in 2014 when by <laughs> Here it is. Best Buy short story. <laughs> Sorry, my brain is fried. From... That is a that is a shameless, <laughs> shameless plug. I can't believe that I couldn't even remember the name of my own book. That is really shocking. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh yeah, that I. You know, my publisher was like, oh, we'll just put it out as an ebook. And I'm like, uh, no, I need it in print so I can submit it to the Lammy Awards. I can't even submit it to my own awards that I run unless there's a print copy to be had. So she relented and she did a print on demand version, which means, you know, if someone wants one, then they print one. They don't you know, print hundreds or thousands of copies that sit in a warehouse somewhere. So, um, you know, it does mean sort of retooling your manuscript for print on demand. Every different type of publishing that you do requires a retooling as I understand it. You know, someone has to redo the manuscript so that it'll work within a certain kind of, uh, and I can't even think of the word for that, because, you know, disability brain, old lady brain, <laughs> put them both together, and, you know, I've lost half my vocabulary, so. Um, well, and it's, it's also 9.30, so <laughs> we may all be getting to be beginning to lose our vocabulary a little bit. Um, unless we have any last questions. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Wait, let's I see. Uh, oh, this, this is an interesting one. Uh, what do the writers think about the market seeming to move towards electronic publishing slash reading? Anybody who wants to take that can. Yes, Elia. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. Most of my books are digital first as an erotic romance author. That's how people consume the genre I write. Most people are not buying print copies of it. Um, they're books that you want to get when you want them and you want them now and you want to read them. Um, and so I like the way it promotes accessibility. I'm really a fan of the way um, e-readers um, are like, they're an accessibility aid also um sure. and i it, at the same time it was it's really fun to see my books in bookstores um but i think that e-reading um and digital publishing is um it's where we're headed and i don't think it'll replace print publishing i think it works alongside you're here anyone else yeah really anyone else want to take that on Well, we do have another one while well, you guys are thinking about it. As a visual artist, the creative process for me involves a lot of sketching and letting the ideas stew in my head and in my hand. As writers, do you have similar stages to the sketching and the stewing? I mean, I think uh, I, I even do a bunch of sketches sometimes of like the my locations, floor plans of houses that I'm going around in in my head just to make sure I've got everything <laughs> in order. Um, but yeah, a lot of it I feel like is just reading other people's work and um, partaking in any sort of art is like an, a good way for me to recharge and get ready to write the next thing or to take a break and um but yeah I think the the more especially I because I'm a 
poet too and my first two books are poetry and hopefully that will continue um but yeah like I think there's a lot of like t t tending to the art feel <laughs> like in you <laughs> um and and you don't know how that'll be um necessarily but yeah but draw drawing surprising I'm terrible at drawing but it's a large part of my <laughs> like get, getting towards what I want to do or, or being in the right space for it Anyone else? Yeah, I I do the same thing. I do a lot, I actually do a lot of floor plans as well. When I'm uh, writing, I'll have a lot of little squares and then I have a lot of little squares within little squares so that I can mm -hmm. tell where people are. And sometimes I'll come across, cause I always have like 27 post-its around, even though I outline everything and I keep a notebook, which is here. I always have like 27 post-its on my desk and I will also draw diagrams that I will find later. They're very mysterious. <laughs> so I have like, if I do a fight scene or sometimes if I do, cause this is an erotica novel, sometimes you have to visualize things, especially if there are multiple people involved. <laughs> Elia, I'm sure you know about this. Because you, you don't want to suddenly get to the end of the scene and someone's leg cannot be where someone's leg is su supposed to be. So you definitely have to do a fair amount of, you know, like figuring, figuring things out, um, which sometimes happens on paper and sometimes happens like watching things. So um, yes, post-its. Definitely <laughs> post-its and drawings, yes, and erasers. I feel like there should be an art book that comes out now from all of your books and all of your sketches. Oh no, nobody wants that for me. That would be, that would be a bad. We term. all want that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I my background is in anthropology, and I just picture somebody like coming upon my office and finding these strange drawings that are just a bunch of rectangles and circles and stuff. What is this? Oh, it's from a sex scene. Okay. <laughs> All I can say is that a Jackson Pollock sold for 38 million a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, and it was just lines and splatters of paint. So, hey, you never know. I have a question for Ben. Um, you write a lot about your your ethnicity, your background, the strong connection you feel to very different aspects of your heritage. And I'm not even sure that you got them all in there. <laughs> um, so what is my question exactly? I don't know. You're, you're just, when you, when you write about that, it's so, it's deep, it's uh, evocative. Um, how do you balance all that in your writing? Yeah. And has yeah. it all come out or is there more that we haven't even heard of yet? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, one of the funny things that kept happening to me was I would submit a book to get published, right? And, you know, one poem would be leaning heavily on, you know, my Cuban heritage. One would be leaning heavily on my, like, Japanese heritage. And the reader, you know, if they're not getting the kind of nonfiction picture, they're thinking, like, what the fuck is this guy writing about? He's all over the place. There's no... And I, I kept getting having publishers say, like, we need some kind of um, overarching narrative thread, right, where you have a poem or you, you know, bring everything together. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. And then eventually I was like, I need to get a job. So, you know, whatever people are interested in, um, you know, that's what I'm going to give them. Um, and just like Rosebud was saying, I really try and get to... Um, you know, the hard stuff, the interesting stuff, whatever is very, you know, conflicted. I try to not shy away from it. 
sometimes I'll write something just for myself. Um, I try and get all the audience, you know, what, whatever they might say out of my head. I just write it for me. Like it's more of a, you know, journal entry. Um, and then, you know, three months later, I'm not so scared about showing it to the world. Right. Um, but I'm always bumping into, you know, oh, what if I write about my family and, you know, there are certainly parts of family that I haven't even written about yet. Um, I'm currently writing a lot of essays about, um, in 2011, my Down syndrome brother was murdered. And so for a long time, um, you know, I wasn't, I was kind of in that, that same camp where I'm like, am I, I don't want to be disrespectful about this. I don't want to, you know, speak for my, my, you know, entire family. Um, but I also kind of had that similar moment. Um, what did you say? It was, you know, if anyone can, you know, speak for us and, you know, for what happened, it would be you. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to take on that, you know, courage more and write more about it. Um, and, you know, I'm always professing to my students how therapeutic poetry can be um, and how wonderful it can be to kind of dig into those conflicts on the, you know, page. So through the writing is how I'm trying to get, you know, everything kind of congealed together. I've got a question. Okay. And this is for any of the writers. Um, do you do you write with a specific audience in mind, or do you write to build your own audience? I write for myself first. Um, I can't get through a first draft if I'm thinking of the audience because I get too paralyzed on what people will think by what people will think. Um, and then when I do revisions, I think more about um, like what, like appealing to my readership. And I, I tend to just write what I like and I'm slowly cultivating an audience of like other people who like those things because you can't appeal to everybody. So I just hope that the people who like my stuff find me and the rest of them, they can leave their reviews and then read someone else. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Hot corners. Um, yeah, I think for me, my stuff tends to be uh, really weird. Um, so I have to let myself write for myself. If I don't, I end up trying to write for an audience and then subverting it, which is like a bad time. Like that's not, don't write romance novels where people expect tropes to happen and then do the opposite of the, tro the tropes. It's, it's not gonna be a good time for anybody. Um, so I, I have actually spent a lot of time this year after um, Lot's Wife came out last year and then I wrote a book about um, a, like a queer selkie in Appalachia who lives forever. I mean, it's a whole weird scene and it's hard sometimes because you know that your stuff is um, a little uh, outside what you might find elsewhere. Um, but I think you just have to keep doing it because I mean, what else are you gonna do? You know, I, for me, this is what I do and trying to do something else doesn't does not work. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, I think doing what I do and then hoping that the right audience finds it, that's all you can ask for. Anybody else have a take on this question? Anybody else want to ask each other a question? I was going to say about the, the audience, it, I found it really different with different genres. Like for poetry, I often feel like that's a direct communication with a reader. So I'm constantly thinking about 
my reader, like not a, not appealing to them, but talking to them and um, how that it's a back and forth in a way, even though you don't get to hear the other side until much later. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm sending it out to my, my best friends right after, and I, I'm thinking about them and then I'm incorporating their feedback where, and then fiction was this totally different thing where it was, well, one, I didn't think I could write fiction when I started writing fiction. So it was, I thought this will go in a drawer later and no one will care, but I'll have done it because I couldn't stop thinking about NEMA. So it didn't have to come out anyway. Um, um, but even when I started writing the next book, when I was like, oh, I, 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 I know how to do this <laughs> and I, I seem to be able to, um, like that was, it still was, uh, yeah, it's just like a, a much more private thing. I, it's, I'm trying to do the story. Like I, I know people will read it, but it's not like every poem to me feels very directly like I'm writing it to, to someone, whoever they might be. Um, so yeah, that was a really different, it's a really different way of writing, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I could answer that question. When I was uh, putting together Best Buy short stories, uh, I noticed we didn't have a senior citizen story and I wanted to get as much diversity into the book as possible, not just one age group being written about. So I set out to write a senior citizen story for the book, because I wanted to make sure we have one. I think we got another one like after, but um, so I imagined myself as you know, 80 something. It wasn't that hard because, you know, I've been 80 since I was 37, which is when I came, you know, became disabled. And, um, you know, I felt like 80, even if I don't look like 80, <laughs> but so I just, and I also had a bi boyfriend in the past who worked at, who, who was volunteering at a nursing home in the village. He had very long hair and the ladies there loved to play with his hair. And eventually he got hired there. But, um, so I was imagining myself in a nursing home in the village, which I could never afford in real life, but I'm down there and, uh, you know, I've been in bed for a few days and I haven't gotten out and, you know, the aid you know comes in and makes me get out of bed and puts my wheelchair over by the window and hands me my hairbrush and uh you know so i'm drinking a juice and i'm brushing my hair and you know i hear some noise coming around the corner and there's like uh you know a pride march outside and i'm like you know what the hell you know they celebrate every other holiday around here. Where is my rainbow cookie? <laughs> you know? And I'm watching these different scenes go by. Very interesting, very colorful. And then, um, you know, I decide I want to get, I, ha I haven't been in a parade in a while, being that I'm in the nursing home, so I'm getting in there. You know, um, so I kind of sneak around, you know, I go downstairs and I kind of sneak out when no one's looking and go down the ramp and some, you know, the bi group is coming by and someone helps me, you know, moves the thingamajig <laughs> and I get into the parade and I'm, um, you know, I'm being rolled down by this guy, young guy. And uh, so that was, you know, the basic story, you know, just the impulse to connect again, you know, to my community as a elderly person whose needs are not being filled in that way. So, um, that's 
I kind of did it for like the hole that I saw in the book for the need of the book. And I don't really have much imagination, honestly. So imagining myself in this situation made it easier for me. And I didn't have that much trouble imagining myself, uh, you know, as elderly. Um, so that, you know, that's how that story was born. But of course, you know, it was all about bisexuality. So, and other things that I know, like, you know, being less abled and having to navigate your way, you know, around things that aren't necessarily <sighs> built up for you and your, your special needs you know, some of which are emotional. Um, not all special needs are physical, you know, and having that connection to community is very important to me. So um, those were all things I could easily imagine <laughs> and write about. So Elia has left us. Bye, Elia. And Ray is leaving. And Jan is leaving. And Robin Renee is leaving. Robin, I'm getting those, I'm getting that music. Well, it's probably time for us to go. It's like- Yes, it is almost 10 o'clock. I haven't eaten any dinner yet. Thank you everybody for coming. It was such a wonderful event. I really had a great time listening to all of you. It was just so much fun. Yes. It's wonderful. Keep writing, keep working, keep loving, and stay safe, please. And thank you so much for being part of our event and giving, you know, our audience something really special. Um, you know, a special experience that's a once in a lifetime experience, really. And you were all, you know, really great. <laughs> you know, I really enjoyed the readings. You never know. You know, you see someone's writing is great, but they're not always great readers. So thank you. All right, folks. Have a great night. <laughs>